Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Glad to see you. Uh, Glad to see you. Concerned about my wife right now. She's not here yet, so usually she is, so just keep her in prayer. Uh, also, there's several people that are out of town. My son's out of town. Sandy's sick. Uh, William's sick. Lisa's sick. Sonny's sick. Chris has had a really rough night with his daughter, so he's trying to catch up on some much needed sleep. And uh, so we need to keep him in prayer today. Um, and the Lord knows the needs that are in this house. Um, you have me and Linda today. So you're going to have to do your part. I mean, you sing loud and, and uh, help us out here while we do, um, do service today. All right? Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you, dear Lord, that you're mindful of everything we face every day. And I pray in Jesus' name that, dear Lord, you would just help us, Father, to lean on your everlasting arms, trust you, dear Lord, in the midst of struggle and battle. And, Father, I pray that uh, what we do here today would bring glory, honor, and praise to you. We thank you, Father, for those visiting with us. We ask you, Father, just to touch those by Facebook, minister to their needs as well. And I ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Everybody say it together. Amen. 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 Well, I guess you stand and sing a couple songs with me, all right? Well, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Well, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Well, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Sing it with me, all right? Once a sinner far from Jesus, 
Oh 
that you wouldn't be here. <laughs> then I had a song picked out for Chris to sing. Linda said he wouldn't be here. <laughs> and so guess what? <coughs> I'm all by yourself. Folks. I'm all by myself. But, uh, this no, song, uh, Chris usually sings this song. And prayerfully he won't get mad at me for doing it. But uh, It's just on my heart. And I wanted him to be here to sing it. But... Uh, I'm so glad that I realized a long time ago that my Savior is beautiful, that there's no one that compares to him. So you pray for me as I try to sing it right? and get this to work.
his name. Let's turn this echo off. I don't think you want to. Oh, it's already on. Didn't have any help on that one. I had to use it all on my one. My voice. Praise the Lord. Amen. Um, you want to follow along? I pray if you brought your Bible. In saying this of me, and it's kind of true, uh, unless you've got the Bible so memorized in your heart that every time I go to a scripture, well, yeah, I know where that was. Uh, I don't know anybody like that. Uh, so if you come without it, uh, I've been saying this, you're naked. Because it's the very word of God. He speaks to us through his word. That's why I do have a problem when people come and tell me they have a word for me because if it's not what God's been saying to me or if they can't back it up with scripture, I have a hard time being able to receive it. And that to me is just wisdom. To know that God's word is true. But uh, if you'd like to follow along with me, I'd like you to turn to the book of Jeremiah. I've been in Jeremiah for I don't know, a couple of months now reading it, taking my time through it, and every time I read read it, I'm thinking, man, what a mess Israel is in, and then I start thinking, well, what a mess we're in, because we are so much like um, Israel. Our time here is very short. If you think about it, if you live to be 100 years old, that's just a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. It's kind of like a guy drew a big long line one time, and he put a little dot right here and said, now this is you. And he said, that's the end of your life. But then eternity goes on and on and on. And depending on who you're in a relationship with will determine where you're going to spend all of eternity. Now, some, I know some people don't believe in hell anymore, but I do. And I know one thing for sure. I don't want to go there. If it's anything like the story that Jesus told about the rich man and how lifting up his eyes, being in torment. If it's anything at all like that. And then there's, um, there's this one part of the verse there that uh, when he's speaking to Father Abraham. And he says, remember, it's a big word in that verse. Remember what you had in your lifetime. Remember how many times you heard the gospel. Remember how many times you had an opportunity to change. Remember how many times you could have been better. Remember how many times you had an opportunity to give your heart and life to Christ. Remember, remember, remember. And he just says it over and over again uh, in the book that I've been reading by uh, John Bunyan. It's just it's just phenomenal how many times there was things to remember. How many times you were invited to church but didn't go. Remember how many times someone prayed for you but you didn't pay no attention. Remember how many times you heard the gospel but you didn't do anything about it. Just remember, remember, remember. And I, uh, when I'm reading in Jeremiah, it's like Jeremiah is talking to Israel and he's saying, please. He's actually almost begging them to turn back to God. They had gotten so far away from the Lord that it was just mind-boggling. And if I have a title for this message, y'all gonna hang in, you'll hang in here for a little while, right? Amen. Praise yeah. the Lord. Why do men obey men more than God? That's a question. Why do men obey men more than God? Isn't it amazing? How we will obey the laws of the land, we'll obey the government, we'll obey the boss that we have, we'll obey, sometimes we'll even obey our husband or our wife, we do all this stuff, but when it comes to obeying God, sometimes it's like pulling teeth, getting people to do what God's asking them to do, and I'm not going to tell you what to do, because I believe the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to be able to put into your mind what you need to do. Whatever the subject might be, whether it's go on a mission trip, whether it's to give finance to help somebody over here or over there, whatever God deals with you about, 
I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, I spoke to a young lady recently concerning the computer that we had to buy. And uh, I said, you know, if you want to help us, <laughs> be okay with me. And she goes, well, if the Lord lays it on my heart. I said, okay. Well, what well, the Lord wants to lay it on her heart because she gave me a check. So. Or if you felt guilty or whatever, I don't know. I just, I'm grateful to the Lord for everyone that's ever helped us in this house. Sometimes I walk around here and I'm just overwhelmed by all the stuff that's here because of what people have done. Some people, uh, you know, look at these altars, these railings, that TV, this rock formation, that picture on the wall. Uh, those were all donated things. They, they weren't, they didn't cost us, we didn't. I mean, we bought pews, but and I don't remember how we got all those, but we did. Somehow, some way, God worked it out. Um, speaker system, stuff like that that God's given us. I'm just, I've, I've become overwhelmed sometimes. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm walking around the parking lot this morning praying and just looking at our parking lot thinking, boy, we need help here. And yet, I realized that I was talking to the guy across the street. He just got his whole new parking lot put in for his church, you know. And I said, what was that, about 20000 He goes, no, it was 120000 I went, oh, gosh, I guess we're not going to get one. <laughs> it's the Lord. But, hey, it is what it is. And you know what? The parking lot means nothing if nobody's here. Amen. You know what? So I'm, I'm grateful to the Lord for what we have out there. God's blessed us over and over again in so many different areas, and I'm grateful. But... There's, there's a story here that's uh, in Jeremiah 35. Can you turn there with me? It's a story that I somehow, some way, had not, was not something that was in my memory banks. And when I started reading it, I went, wow. Men obeying a man was mind boggling for me. But it begins in, I think, uh, are you, are you there, Jeremiah 35? Say amen if you're there. Amen. Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, beginning in verse 12, then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction to hearken to my words, saith the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed, for unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. Now, these Rechabites, if you read the first part of this chapter, their father had told them to abstain from several things. Well, he's dead. But they're still doing it. They're still following what he told them to do. He told them, you know, don't drink wine, don't buy land, don't do this, don't do that. And they're, they're obeying it. And so Jeremiah comes along and God is saying to the Israelites, look at these people. It's a man obeying, these are men obeying a man, and they have stuck with it year after year after year after year. They follow what he said. And yet Jeremiah said, through God, he said, I, I've come. I don't know how many times he said the words in fact, he said, I have sent me. Also unto you, in verse 15, all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your fathers, but ye have not inclined your ear nor hearkened unto me. Because the son of Jonadab, the sons of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them, but this people hath not hearkened unto me. Therefore thus saith the Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard, and I have called unto them, but they have not answered. And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, 
Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according to all that he hath commanded you, therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the sons of Jacob, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. Obeying the laws of a man. And yet we can't get people to obey the things of God. Are <coughs> you okay? Yes. There is a great, I'm going to read a lot of this, but I feel like I need to. But it says, there is a great misconception in the church today that we can love God and the world at the same time, even though Jesus said we must choose one or the other. I'm going to say that one more time. There is a great misconception in the church today that we can love God and the world at the same time, even though Jesus said we must choose one or the other. In Joshua chapter 20, verse 24, verse 15, it said, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers which served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But he said, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and men. How much of us does God really have? How much, how, much, how much does he have? Does he have all of you? I, I, I wonder sometimes that. Even for myself, it's like, does he really have all of me? You know, Ruth, I hope you don't mind me saying this. She said there was something she had to deal with while she was gone away, and she said, I got victory. There was another part that had to be surrendered so that she could have all of God. It's one thing for me, for God to have all of me, but it's another thing for me to have all of God. I, there, there's, there's more to him. There's, there's, there's more to him than I think sometimes we even realize. He's bigger than the cross around your neck or, you know, the gospel music that you listen to or for the Bible that you leave sitting on your coffee table. He, there's more. He's bigger than that. He, he's looking for people that are hungry to know him more. The Apostle Paul gets, I mean, if anybody loved Jesus, it was the Apostle Paul. And yet he gets down to the end of his life and he says, that I might know him. I'm thinking, what are you talking about, Paul? You do know him. He goes, not, not like he knows me. I want to know him like he knows me. I, I want to be able to let him have sway in every area of my life. And if he tells me to do something, I do it. If he tells me to stop doing something, I stop doing it so that I can have all of him in my life. It says, uh, how much of us does God really have? How much influence does the world have over our decisions? Is it God's word that guides my life or the imaginations of my own heart? In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, he said, Wherefore, seeing we're compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, and you say, what in the world is he talking about? He's talking about all those people that were in chapter 11, all those that gave their life for the cause of Christ, all those people that were waiting for the promise of Jesus to come. They all waited, and they kept waiting, and they kept waiting, and that they kept following, and they kept following. And he says, and all these cloud of witnesses, he said, they're, they're all around us. He said, let us lay aside, because we have all these witnesses. He said, we need to lay aside every weight and sin, which does so easy to set us, and let us run with patience. The race that is set before us. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Consider what Jesus had to go through to purchase our salvation. And then think about yourself, what you have to go through. Have we, any of us resisted unto blood? Have any of us had to give our lives for the cause of Christ? 
There are books out that you can read, and you can read stories of Christian martyrs that literally nothing moved them. They were so committed in their relationship with God that they refused to let anything get in their life that would drag them away from God. Are we that committed? Boy, y'all are quiet. I know I've been a little. Uh, I don't think, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna say I've been rough. I've been honest. I, I've been trying to be truthful. I've been trying to tell us how near we are to the end. Amen. It's okay to make plans for your future and what you're gonna do, but you need to realize something. Like the rich man in hell, I'm gonna tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And get Give me more stuff. I'm just going to, and then I'm going to sit back and say, take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And the scripture said, there was a voice of God that came and said, this night, your soul should be required of thee. Now who's going to get all your stuff? You ever think about it? Someone was saying to me yesterday, he says, you know, you know, when something happens to you, he says, your, your kids are just going to throw all your stuff away. I looked at him and said, oh no, they won't throw all my stuff away. I said, I got some good stuff. <laughs> they'll keep what they want and the rest of it they'll throw away. But yeah, that's what in fact, they'll probably clean the basement out in 20 minutes. <laughs> right? <coughs> yeah, what I really want to leave behind for my children is not my stuff, but a testimony that said I love Jesus. Amen. So that they can walk by whatever thing I might be placed in, whether it's a casket or an urn or whatever, and say, my dad loved Jesus. Because I do. Do I fail? Yeah. More often than I even want to admit. But I'm so glad for his grace. I'm so glad for his mercy. I'm so glad that he never gives up on me. I'm not going to give up on any of you either. I'm going to keep telling you the truth, even if it makes you Praise mad. God. You say, well, brother, sometimes you make me mad. Well, I don't mean to. It's not my forte. I'm, I'm a pretty nice fellow. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like last week I told you about that guy that said I looked like I was 59. Phil yells out, is he blind? That's and that's my friend. And yet I realize every day that I'm getting older, things are progressing in my physical life, and I know that I can't do what I used to. I tried playing softball two weeks ago. <laughs> Me and Don are both. I did okay for a guy 72 years old. You did great. Yeah, well, I don't know about great, but I was out there. And then I got done, and they said, you going to play the second game? I said, oh, no. <laughs> got, in a little, uh, got in a little dug out here and said, what in the world was I thinking? <laughs> you know what? And I loved it. I For years, I played. I, I till I was like 65 years old, I played. I just but. After a while, you just say, you know what? When the ball goes by and you said, I should have got that, it's time to <laughs> do something different. The faithfulness and, let me say this one more time. Faithfulness and obedience was the testimony of the Rabbis. They were faithful and they were obedient to what their father had told them. We as individuals when we were growing up and our parents were telling us what to do there were just certain things that we didn't let them know we were doing unless we got caught you know some folks went to jail whenever it said they had to call dad hey <laughs> sorry i know i told you i was obeying you and doing what you told me to do but this isn't working out can you come get me you know we we have those days, and but they had this, they said they, they wouldn't drink wine. For John and Evans, in a break of our father commanded us, saying, 
you shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not up here beating the desk about drinking, cussing, smoking, dipping all. I mean, if God doesn't tell you to quit something, you're never going to quit it anyway. Hello? Amen. It's like I was talking to, I think it was Ruth, we were talking about people that have anger. Only the Holy Ghost can help you with that. If you've got anger issues and you're mad all the time, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And you know what the Holy Spirit will say every time you get ready to, to, to lose your temper or to lose it and just kind of go off? And I have my days. People, people hurt me. People will, you know, cut you off or whatever. And the first response usually from our flesh is, I'm going to chase that guy down now. I mean, I remember we was going home from church one day. Day and uh, we was in the van, had kids. We were driving down 75, and I, I guess apparently I cut off this motorcycle. I didn't. I, yeah, I ride. I, I would never do that on purpose. He went by our van and threw a lock. And it's just. I mean, I'm glad it didn't come through the window, but it hit the van, and I'm mad. I hit the gas. I'm going as fast as I can. I'm going to catch that motorcycle and run him right off the road. I'm sorry. I'm just telling you that I was true. And the whole time, Barb's screaming at me. <laughs> and before we got off the exit to get on the telegraph where he had got off, she had calmed me down. And I just said, you know what? It's not worth it. And sometimes I think we don't realize that our angers sometimes hinder. Can I say it that way? Hinder our testimony. Yes, it does. Can you say amen to that? Amen. It hinders our testimony. And people that see it go, I mean, I remember we used to play against certain softball teams. And I remember one time we were playing softball and the pastor from the other team was out there. And there was a play, and somebody got called out, and the pastor was screaming at the top of his lungs at the umpire. And I'm, like, I'm not even a preacher yet. I'm just playing softball and singing. I, I'm thinking, what in the world is wrong with that guy? He, he, he's supposed to be the example. He's supposed to be the light. That's my job. I'm supposed to be the example. I'm supposed to be the light. If I lose it, if I go crazy, do stupid stuff, you're going to look at me and say, well, man, if he can do it, I can do it. And so there's just certain things as a pastor and as a Christian, I guess, I just don't do them. You think they're wrong? Well, yeah, some of them are wrong. But you know what? I can't tell you what to do. You're not going to listen to me anyway. The only way anybody's going to stop doing anything that they shouldn't be doing is if the Holy Spirit convicts their heart so much so that inside of them they're saying, God, help me. i got to get a handle on this because I can't be victorious if I don't. And please, don't be a pitchfork Christian. Anybody know what a pitchfork Christian is? A pitchfork Christian is the guy or the lady that sits in church and when the message is being preached, they say, boy, I'm sure glad she's here. She really needed to hear this. <laughs> or I'm sure glad he's here. He sure needed to hear this. They pitch it over on somebody else. I learned a long time ago, when the message is preached, apply it to your own life before you pitch it anyplace else. Realize we all got to have help. Don't we? I gotta have help. I do. I am a better, well, I guess my wife would have to say that. I think I'm a better husband right now than I've ever been. I think I'm a better father now than I've ever been. Hopefully a better grandfather than I've ever been. Well, if, if I go somewhere to the flea market or whatever, I'm not even looking for stuff for me anymore. I'm looking for stuff for my kids or for the wife. You, know, you just bring stuff home because you want to, you know, show that you really love them. Because sometimes love is expressed in what we give. We honor God by our tithing. Did you know that? That honors God when you pay your tithe. 
That honors God when you give an offering. That honors God when you donate something to make sure that the kingdom of heaven goes forward. That, that honors God. And I think sometimes we don't look at it that way. They just want my money. No, it's not about that. It's about giving honor to God. I have been a tither my whole Christian life. Do I do, I do it perfectly? Probably not. But I do my best to try to let God know that what he's blessed me with, he gets his part. Don't I owe him everything? Absolutely. Come on. I need an amen or a... I owe him everything. I wouldn't have health. I wouldn't have strength. I wouldn't be able to stand up here this morning if God did not help me. I realize that. I know that. Look at, look at Peggy sitting down here. You're, what, 80? 86. 86 years old. She don't look a day over 60. Why? Because God has blessed her. Praise Why? Because God. she surrendered her life to him. Praise God. That's right. And then she also, is like my sister used to say, she realizes when the barn needs painting, I'll just paint it. Right? right? I always appreciate a woman that takes care of herself. I really do. A woman that will put her makeup on and comb her hair and if she wants to, get her nails done, toes done, whatever else she's got to get done to make herself look presentable. I always appreciate it. I always feel so sorry for these guys that are Amish. If I had to go home with some of them women, I think I'd just probably say, no, nah, I'm not going home. Right. I'm sorry. I, they look like they need somebody to give them an overhaul. They might be great, perfect on the inside, but the outside picture doesn't show me much. Right. Oh, gosh, why did I go there? I didn't go there. But you understand what I'm saying? Yes. My, uh, I had cousins. They were always cheating on their wives. I mean, just they, every time they turn around, they go out with some other woman or whatever. And uh, they asked my dad one day, and I thought it was pretty good wisdom from my father. But they asked my dad, said, why, why do our husbands keep cheating on us? He goes, well, look at you. He says, you don't ever comb your hair. You don't ever put on any makeup. You don't ever look presentable when he comes home. What in the world? Why would he want to come home to that? And you know what? They took that advice. They started combing their hair, putting on their makeup, looking decent when they came, and their husband stopped cheating on them. Amen. <laughs> Boy, I'm getting myself in deep. You are. <laughs> I'm sorry. Walk us right through it, the women. It's truth, though. It is. <coughs> I try to present myself the best I can. Somebody said, why are you going to tie on something? I just felt like it was more pastorish. <laughs> you look handsome, brother. I thought, yes. I, I need to look a little. Don't get me wrong. I don't care if you were a tie or not for a tie. You don't care if I do. But it's amazing to me every time I wear one, everybody goes, man, you look nice. <laughs> Thanks. I'm supposed to be the example. I'm supposed to be the light. I'm the shepherd in the house. I'm the one that's standing at the door of the sheep coat. I'm that guy that when the wolf comes, I'm saying, listen, you ain't getting in. Amen. That's my job. That's who I am. That's what I'm supposed to do. And so I've got to keep myself in a condition to be able to be the shepherd. I can't just do anything I want to do anymore. I have got a responsibility to everybody that God allows me to be ministering to. Where did I leave off? Oh, faithfulness and obedience. That's what was coming from the Jacobites. Or the Rankabites, I mean. He said, he, 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 their dad had told them, don't even build no houses to dwell in. Neither have a vineyard, neither field nor seed. But we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that John and our father commanded us. In other words, they said, listen, we're going to be, a, it, it's wonderful when you can find some people that will say, I'm going to obey all the laws. Aren't you glad people don't run red lights and stop signs and stuff? I mean, because we're driving out there too. You know, we're glad when people obey men, but wouldn't it be better if we learned to obey God and we did what we yes. did because it was in obedience to God? Yes. Amen. Huh? Yes. Amen. Oh, Amen. praise the Lord. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah saying, Thus 
saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, go and tell the men of Judah and the heaven to Jerusalem, will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my word, saith the Lord? The words of John the Baptist, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine are performed, for unto this day they drink none, but obey their, and hearken at their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I have spoken unto you, rising early, speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. Does God speak to you? Does he? Yes. Well, what do you do when he speaks to you? I listen. Try to obey, right? Well, yeah, but some of the stuff he's asked me to do is just kind of. I asked somebody one time, I said, You want to go with me, did he? No, no. Why not? I ain't going across that water. I said, well, What if God asks you to do that? He goes, It'd be, it'd be up to him because I'm not doing it. <laughs> That, that's sad isn't it? that God could ask us to do something and we look at him and say, no, but that's what he was saying to Israel. I ask you to follow me. He said, I have sent also unto you my servants, the prophets rising up early and sending them, saying, return ye now every man from his evil way and amend your doings and go not after other gods to serve them, and ye shall dwell in this land which I have given you and your fathers, but ye have not inclined your ear nor hearkened unto me. Why are we so willing to obey men, yet reluctant to obey God? We obey men and negotiate with God, running close, running as close to the edge of sin as possible. Can I do this, God? God says, no. Oh, well, I don't know if I heard you. Jesus said, if you love me, he went, can you finish the verse for me? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. The Apostle Paul said, don't be entangled with the affairs of this life, for we have been bought with the price, the precious blood of Christ, and we don't belong to ourselves any longer. Hebrews, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reference, shall we not much more be subject unto the Father of spirits, and live. In other words, if we're willing to obey our parents, we should be willing to obey God. Thus saith the God and the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, the spirit of them that walk therein, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. He said, Look, I, I gave you everything you got. And I've called you to be righteous, to walk clean, to be pure in my sight. Is that too hard? No. Yeah, it probably is. But you know what? Half-hearted obedience is not obedience at all. I'm going to say it again. Half-hearted obedience is not obedience at all. King Saul learned that when he was called to go and destroy the Amalekites. And I'm going to close with this. As Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. Samuel had come to Saul and God had told him that he remembered how the Amalekites attacked the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And so he told King Saul, he said, I want you to go to there where the Amalekites are. He said, I want you to just wipe them off the face of the earth. Mm. Sounds cruel, doesn't it? Yeah. That's how much God hates sin. Think about it. They put Jesus on the cross. How bad do we, do we hate sin? Probably not. There's just something we're just going to keep doing no matter what. And he took Agag the king and the Amalekites alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattenings and the lambs and, and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse they that they destroyed utterly, fatlings of every sort. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments, and it giveth grief, Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul comes to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and is gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou, O Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, Well, what meaneth the bleeding of the sheep, and the 
my ears from the lowing of the oxen which I hear. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. He didn't even take responsibility. He just said, it would be like me saying, you know, I, I'm doing okay, but these people out here, <laughs> gosh, Lord, you need to really work on them. That's basically what Saul was saying. You know, I, I went to do what you wanted me to do, but, you know, I feared the people. Wow. Think about it. That's what he said. I feared the people. But Bible says don't fear the one can destroy your body. He said, fear the one who can destroy your body and cast your soul into hell. That's the one you're supposed to fear. Amen. When Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, uh, let me, I've read all that. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice them to the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Even when you say it like that, and saying, well, we brought them back because we were going to sacrifice them to the Lord. That, that still doesn't hold water with God because he said, I told you to do one thing and now you're telling me you're going to do something else. You're going to change the whole dynamic of what I told you to do. Don't you realize how many people, I mean, the Amalekites, if you go back and read the story there in Exodus, when you read the story about them, they attacked the feeble and the old that were in the back of the line when all of those people came out of Egypt and they were just killing the kids and they were killing the old people. That's what, and God said, I remember what they did. Maybe you forgot. Maybe you got to the place where you don't care. But he said, I remember, so I want you to get rid of all of them. And then Samuel said to Saul, stay and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, say on. And Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, was not thou made to head of the tribe of Israel? And God anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, go and not only destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are be consumed. Wherefore, thou didst not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the spoil, the sheep, the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, the sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Because he said the sin of disobedience is like witchcraft. Next time you decide you don't want to obey the Lord, think about it being told as being called witchcraft. Scary thought. Hath the Lord of the great delight in offerings and sacrifices in obeying the voice what to obey is better than sacrifice to hearken than the fat of rams. Now, I'm trying to be kind, but I want us to understand that no, I, I, have, I have my responsibility to God. You have your responsibility to God. Yes. I expect you to do what God's asking you to do. You say, well, I don't have to obey you. You're right, you don't. I'm just a man. But if the Rechabites could obey their father, why couldn't you come to the place where you say, I want to obey God? Amen. We would, and, and, and I felt like the Lord gave me this, but he said, we would not tolerate unfaithfulness in a spouse or disobedience in a child. Am I right about that? We would not tolerate unfaithfulness in a spouse or disobedience in the child. We must never forget that we are God's children and he calls us his bride. God told Israel if they would be faithful and obedient, they would eat the good of the land. You want to have God's blessings on you? Learn how to obey him. Amen. Last verse. For he that will love life and see good days, let him restrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil 
and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it or follow after or press forward towards it. But the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Why do men obey men more than God? Almost every day. I love you. I know I've told you a couple of things today. That, as one scripture said, put your teeth on the edge. Because, well, is he talking to me? If the Holy Spirit isn't convicting you about something, pay no attention to what I said. Because if the Holy Spirit doesn't drive it home to your heart, there's nothing I can do to make it happen. You know that, right? Say amen, Pastor. Amen. I know that. I know this, though. The Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart about certain things that I need to make some adjustments on. I was going to say changes, but sometimes we just need to make an adjustment. I mean, when we have kids, sometimes they do stuff that they shouldn't do, and usually we have to give them an attitude adjustment. Yes. Chase is looking at his dad. <laughs> it's true, though. I'm still not bashful about telling my kids what's right and what's wrong, what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. And sometimes I'll see them do things that I don't think they should be doing. I'm okay, what are you doing? Don't you realize that you're supposed to be the light? You're supposed to be the testimony? You're supposed to be the person that people can look to for comfort and help and strength and guidance and direction? Don't profess to be something you're not. And don't say you've been filled with the Holy Spirit if you haven't been. There's nothing wrong with you not being filled yet, but then there should be a part of you that says, I'm hungry. I want God to fill me with that power so that I can be that witness unto all the people that I come in contact with. That should be the desire of each and every one of us. Shouldn't we be getting better and better? Yes. Yes. Please? Amen. Amen. Shouldn't we be getting better and better? Yes. Amen. I'm trying. How many times you fall down? None of your business. You know why I don't tell people some things that I struggle with? Because I know they probably wouldn't forgive me. But I have a God that when I fall on my face and I come to him and I say, I repent, Lord, and I'm sorry, he forgives me and he forgets about it. People don't know how to do that. They can't. And that's okay. Do you want to know everything about people in the church? No. I don't want to know what you're doing. If God can't keep you right, <laughs> I had somebody say to me one time, would you cross through my house this week? Because after I got them preaching, I went, no. Well, how come you knew everything I did? Well, I didn't. Nobody told me. It was just one of those things the Holy Ghost put in my heart. I don't, I'm, it, excuse me. <laughs> I'm just the mailman. <laughs> I bring the mail. I get mail sometimes in my mailbox. I don't like it either. Hello? Yeah, that's right. But you know what? There's some of that mail that comes that I know I've got to deal with. I mean, I'd love to be able to take that electric bill and just throw it in the trash. <laughs> but you know what? It's going to come in next month, and it's going to be twice as big. And if I do it too often, somebody's going to come by and they're going to go, click, and cut off my electricity. I've got a responsibility to take care of what I need to take care of. You do too. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And wives, see that you reverence your husband. That's what the scripture says. You see, <laughs> women went, ah, I got off, and then all of a sudden, ah. 
Thank you, Lord, for your word that's true. Whether we like it or not, it's true. Grace is not greasy. You don't, you don't just do anything you want to now that you're under grace. I've said this recently and I'll say it to you today. I'm saved by grace, but I'm governed by the laws of God. I know I'm not supposed to lie, cheat, steal, commit adultery, bear false witness. I'm supposed to honor my father and my mother when I did when they were here. And I think that's something that ought to happen for everybody as a child of God, that we ought to try our best to obey and do what God's asked us to do. Give me an amen. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. I love you. What are we singing? He's all I need. He's all I need. And I think some of you all learned how to play the piano and the drums <laughs> and the guitar. Well, when our regular folks sing here, you can help out. It would be great. It would really be good. <laughs> He's all I need. He's all
That had to be young. <laughs> be at that game was exciting. <laughs> you know what? But you know what? It was funny about that day. The Tigers beat the Yankees, which is always a good thing. And the Lions won the football game. It's like, good. okay, good. that's good. Yeah. And yet, Donna sent me a picture of Phil. He was like, so excited. <laughs> about them. And I posted this picture back up there, and I put a little thing on the bottom that says, this is how I feel about Jesus. <laughs> and that's how we should feel about Jesus. Amen. If anybody ought to shout because he saved us, it ought to be us. Amen. And I'm glad I'm saved. How about you? Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Wednesday night we have midweek prayer service and Bible study. So come and be with us. We start prayer about 5.30. About 6.30 we start a Bible study. So um, come down and be part of it, would you? Uh, we'd love to have you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.